All right, everyone, we are ready for another great talk. Um, so my name's Latara, I'll be managing the uh, the talk today. So we're about to watch a talk by Cameron Manavian on Modern Full Stack with Rust, writing reliable code. I'm gonna bring him live just for an introduction. Hi there, Cameron. Hi, everyone. Hello. Yeah. Welcome to Rust Lab. We're very happy to have you here. Thank you. Awesome. It's a uh, morning for me. Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, Let's see, you're, are you in California? Yes, California, okay. so it's about 4.50 in the morning. Oh goodness, yeah, it's quite <laughs> quite early. Well, thank you so much for coming despite the time zone difference. We really appreciate it. <laughs> no problem. Also, all right, well, I'll read your bio and then we'll get started with the talk. All right. So Cameron has over 15 years of experience with full stack web development using PHP, JavaScript, Node.js, C Sharp, and Rust. He has worked on numerous high performance applications that scale for hundreds of thousands of simultaneous users with unique and interactive user interfaces and experiences. He has taught multiple generations of web developers and software en engineers at UCLA Extension in California and is currently a CTO of a final financial technology firm that uses a highly scalable platform to support large calculations in the browser. He also writes extensively in his spare time in between presenting at local conferences and meetups. So in this talk, uh, Cameron Manavian takes a fresh look at the core concepts of Rush, Rust and uh, how it relates to fast, memory-safe, full-stack web development. Uh, we'll see how to use a Rust server with a MySQL database, Redis, Melee Search, Kubernetes, Docker, and WebAssembly to create a single code base that can serve rich web applications. Uh, and if you're interested in compiling Rust to WebAssembly for reliable code on the web, this presentation will help you understand the scope and even get started. So let's have a, have a good show. <laughs> Thank Great. you, Cameron. All right, we're ready for the talk. Enjoy, everyone. Hello, my name is Cameron Manavian, and welcome to my talk, Modern Full Stack with Rust, Writing Reliable Code. Before I begin, I would love to introduce myself and our agenda for this talk. First, we'll talk about me. I'm a father and husband. I'm from Los Angeles, California in the United States. I'm a chief technology officer at Libretto, a financial tech firm. I have over 15 years of experience as a software engineer and a web developer. I code to heavy metal and neo 80s music. And I have four cats and two dogs. Next, let's go over the agenda. I understand that the first chunk of the sections in my presentation may be a little rudimentary for some attendees, but I find that it will help lay the groundwork of how Rust fits into modern full stack and makes this presentation overall more accessible for all watching. First, I'll talk about what is web development. Then I'll talk about full stack development. After that, we'll cover developer operations. And then next, databases and cache. And finally, in the first half of the section, we'll finish with what makes for great full stack developer experience. In the second half, we'll go over Rust and full stack development, which will include the server component, the database, the search engine, the front end code and WebAssembly, and the developer operations hooking everything together. Let's start right now. What is web development? The early stages of the web seem to have moved so slow compared to now. HTML was a pretty new technology, simple yet effective. 
At this time, I think we can classify most of the developers as HTML designers, or the ultra-elite webmasters. As the web progressed, tools like Dreamweaver and FrontPage revolutionized the industry, allowing for rapid creation and management of sprawling HTML-based websites. They also introduced a thing called the WYSIWYG, which is what you see is what you get, allowing for anybody to basically make HTML. Towards the end of the 90s, I think a lot of people that were HTML designers became worried by the simplicity of HTML and its gradual path towards common usage and easy learning curve, which I think was the goal in the first place. Likewise, webmasters were asking for something more. I remember this great quote from a long time ago. In the 90s, once Dreamweaver came out, I knew that anyone could make websites, so I quit my job and became a car salesman. This was actually told to me by a real car salesman after asking what I did for a living. This was from 2009. Moving on, Internet Explorer 4, or IE4, was released in October of 1997, which brought forth the era of DHTML, a fancy way of saying dynamic HTML. This was essentially the first combination of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript with a document object model, or DOM, as most call it nowadays. All of this dynamic content on the front end, or in the browser, made for a great experience. Users were now able to browse websites and get unique reactions on a website, website using DHTML. In the mid to the late 90s, another class of tools was also gaining momentum. Server-side code was making the web a different place and languages such as PHP allowed seamless integration with HTML. It's at this time, and perhaps ever since, that web development has been a growing industry. The primary growth of this industry is driven by money, social impact, fame, and information, and with that, misinformation. Businesses wanted to use their website to advertise and sell products to customers, and also services. So they needed to handle the inflow of traffic and keep people on the site with appealing graphics. Of course, with the growing need to brand oneself online, corporations quickly jumped onto this new internet thing. As the industry blossomed, the ever-increasing need to gain the most traffic required site creators to focus with more targeted approaches. Teams began to grow around interdisciplinary skills and roles, such as web design, which includes user interface design to maintain the brand, look, and feel of a site, user experience design, or UX, to help users keep users happy and make, them into, uh, make things intuitive, copywriting and content production to create enticing and search engine friendly text on websites, product managers and project managers to guide and maintain project velocity while also keeping the development team isolated from external politics, testers to ensure that a site is reliable, accurate, accessible, and usable, and finally, engineers and web developers to create and manage software, architecture, and servers. Now we move on to the next section. Now that we've had a little bit of a history lesson, I would like to review some of the concepts related to a full stack web development role at most companies. What is perhaps one of the most sought out skills in our industry? And one that some may consider fake, impossible, or downright ludicrous? A sense of humor? Nope. I'm of course talking about the holy grail that is full stack web development. If you believe in that kind of thing, what does full stack development even mean? Does it mean you can design UIs, architect scalable apps, write code, configure and run servers, or even dunk on people? The title of the person who can manage a whole website has evolved as time progresses, but in many ways their job is still the same. In 2004, I might have been called a webmaster, or perhaps the man who knows Zorro. In 2010, I was a web developer, 
building applications with PHP, MySQL, Flash, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Now in 2020, I am a full stack engineer, capable of anything and everything web related, at least according to my family. Because a team of engineers or a company can choose what their actual stack is, there are no clear rules about what makes you a full stack developer. But anyone who can program client and server software fits the definition of a full stack web developer. Being a great programmer in general matters too. So, is full stack developer engineer unicorn a recruiter buzzword? In my opinion, it's yes and no, or maybe it depends. If you hire a developer on your team, you'd like for them to at least understand every aspect of your system. They may not be an expert on all the things, but at least they can grasp concepts and ideas. I think being full stack is the very definition of a software engineer. Does that sound a bit harsh? It might at first, but would you call a doctor a full body medical engineer? Should all doctors be able to handle emergency situations to some degree? Yes, I believe they should. Of course, there are specialists, and this is okay. But just about any doctor could help you with an infection, trauma, or broken limbs. You wouldn't want a heart surgeon performing brain surgery, though. Personally, I feel as though there are more clear ways to identify someone's skills within a medium to large team. Yes, everyone should understand the tech and therefore be full stack, but they should also be able to set into, settle into a role that complements the team. If working at a small company or startup, a full stack engineer will be utilized exactly as such across the entire stack. But as a company grows, a full stack engineer typically settles into more defined roles while also maintaining their stack skill set. Many roles have a focus on the back end dealing with databases, servers, DevOps, and APIs. Generally, these people don't see the UI at all and just look at code and databases. Some extremely handy developers are usually placed in what I call the middle stack, focused on bridging the gap between the back end and the front end. Speaking of the front end, we have developers here that are more likely to work along UX and UI designers to polish the look, feel, and branding of a website. Oftentimes, they stick around and get attuned to browser optimizations and UI features. Finally, much like the middle stack folks, we have some engineers that do a bit of everything at a given company. In this role, a senior type engineer is doing a lot of full stack work over time and is capable of making architectural decisions about any part of the application. Another way to approach this full stack terminology is, is to say that if you are full stack, you're probably just an expert or highly experienced. Domain knowledge comes into play here, meaning a developer can be a highly experienced and valuable person at a particular company because they know about system X, Y, or Z. They have invaluable experience within a team and they are inherently full stack engineers even if their title does not reflect that. But I must digress. For the purpose of today, yes, full stack developers are real and they are people like you and me. Learn to love them. Speaking of full stack, here's a typical diagram for web-based application. There's a front-end component that supports mobile devices or desktop browsers, a server component that supports the internal business logic and content retrieval, and a data store which holds all the site's dynamic content. Pretty simple. But web servers aren't that easy. We need to install software, configure them, keep them updated, patch them, address security vulnerabilities, stay attuned with long-term maintenance schedules, keep our systems available, and keep them ready for users and traffic. Can a full stack engineer really do that? I'd like to plant some ideas regarding developer operations to help see the full scope of a full stack engineer's role at a typical small to mid-sized company. Developers and operations teams are often at odds when it comes to being nimble and secure. There is a constant tug of war between the two over how to deploy and maintain application servers. Many aspects of their jobs blur, and there's quite a bit of confusion when it comes to boundaries and requirements to deploy apps. But there doesn't have to be. Developers can adapt and pick up some of the slack of maintaining their required versions and in, in installations, and DevOps teams can focus more on security, reliability, and scale. 
a DevOps engineer can enable developers to better control their own version numbers and package dependencies. We looked at a basic full stack system a little bit ago. Anyone who has done a, big, a bit of developer operations knows that there is probably some implied systems missing from this diagram. Here is just a slice of what could be more modern architecture. We have our front end application still intact, but now we enhance the detail on the server side to show all the pieces of our infrastructure. We can handle network and high loads of traffic with DNS and load balancing systems. We can offload high security application logic into a separate auth authentication server. And we can isolate our content into buckets to ease our scaling concerns. By breaking down our system like this, we can better scale up the highly active servers or add redundancies in different parts of the data storage systems. Of course, when it comes to DevOps, the whale in the room is Docker. Docker is one of the many ways to containerize an app in order to make it usable on many different systems. Docker is fast, it's online in seconds, it's portable, you can move across multiple types of infrastructure or cloud providers, and it's efficient, you can save money and space with it. The components of modern DevOps include the image, which is an immutable app at rest. It has all the files and dependencies baked in. A container is an instance of an image or a running image. The engine or runtime is the working node that executes containers. The registry is where you push and pull images or otherwise store them. And the control plane manages clusters of engines and containers. This all sounds pretty complicated. Thankfully, there's something that's very fancy to manage all this developer operation stuff. And we can use another great tool called Kubernetes. When you deploy containerized apps with a tool like Kubernetes, you can utilize their sets of workers to help orchestrate and manage all of your workloads with ease. Your Docker images are isolated within a worker node, which in turn store a smaller amount, uh, module called a kubelet, which is in charge of running a pod. Pods are one or more running containers, which is just a fancy way of saying Kubernetes can help you set up networking services and get your Docker images to talk to each other or to the wider internet. But this is not just a way to, uh, to sound the very loud and perhaps obvious Kubernetes bell. Instead, I also want to mention that we can certainly use a Rust Docker image, which has an OS and compiled Rust binary of our application ready to go within a container on Kubernetes. You can also run a special type of kubelet called a crustlet. A crustlet is a third party comp complement to kubelets. A kubelet can run a portable application in the form of a Docker image, but a crustlet can run a portable web assembly, assembly binary, which can run on any hardware. It should be noted that you can't replace all Docker images with crustlets that use WebAssembly, but it can handle uh, some other things pretty efficiently. We won't be covering this too much today, as I just so I just wanted to call it out real quick. Now that we've figured out how to transport our apps in a common format with a reliable and standardized technology, we can focus on the last bit of a full stack engineer's job, the data. In this section, we'll review some common practices related to databases and cached using full stack developers' daily workflow. <clears throat> what do we do to keep our data reliable, secure, and scalable? Here, I've selected a picture of a dog. For some, the dog might be the protector of the data. For others, they may interpret him as the data to keep safe behind the closed dates. You know, keep your animals out of harm's way. Or finally, if you're afraid of dogs, I apologize, but perhaps you are the data and the dog is kept away from you. I think this dog looks pretty friendly though. At its core, regardless of which database systems we choose, it's easy to think of them as some hard drive out on the internet or in the cloud. We can save vital information about our apps or our users or a product in a database to keep things safe. There is also, of course, NoSQL. They are a cousin to SQL databases like MySQL, but not related. That was a dad joke for my kids. 
We don't need to discuss, to need to discuss the merits of NoSQL versus rela relational databases, but generally it's desi desirable to use them for their strengths. Many projects utilize both types for different portions of their data needs. To go back to my earlier simplified view of a typical application, we can see that the database is utilized by the server in order to retrieve and collect data to be presented to the user on the front end. In that regard, many architectures opt to include a cache layer to improve availability and scale. Often this is accomplished by a memory database such as Redis or Memcached. Using such systems, we can give our server application a quick boost to performance by adding a thin caching layer at an object level to improve query times and decrease server loads. In this diagram, we can see that we start with a request and we check the cache. If it's in the cache, we can just simply return the cache data and save our database the hassle. If it's not in the cache, we can retrieve the data from the database and then cache it and then also respond with the same data. It kind of creates a, a quicker version of the same data. Our next section is about the developer experience while building apps in a full stack framework. Before we can truly talk about developer experience, I'd like to briefly mention the notion of a 12-factor app. This methodology is designed to give engineers a roadmap and checklist for building software apps and services, ensuring longevity and reducing software rot. In some languages, a true web application framework is not readily available or not very mature. Some of them might call themselves lightweight or flexible, much like a house that only has a frame. It, has, it might have the walls, the roof, the foundation, but it's up to you to pick the floors, interiors, and add the electrical and plumbing. Of course, if I want to build a basic structure, I can get a house-like frame, add my own walls and roof, <clears throat> and call it complete. Since there are no doors or windows, I don't need to cover them up, so I remain flexible. Likewise, if I want a simple web application, I can pick up a lightweight framework and add only the exact features I want, perhaps just JWT authentication and a simple MySQL server with no ORM. If I want a house with a kitchen, a dining room, two stories, I'd probably opt for a more defined structure that affords the quicker building of these amenities. Likewise, if I were to build a more robust application using a full stack framework, I probably want one that is slightly more opinionated and rigid, which in turn affords me the ability to build bigger applications faster because I can focus on the end implementation instead of the nuts and bolts. So when it comes down to it, there are about two paths to, uh, when selecting a framework to use in your project. The first is lightweight, sometimes called micro frameworks like Express, Sinatra, or Silex. These allow developers to build the exact app they want, adding in features as needed. They often are more like a big library of tools that let you easily add in custom logic at any layer. And since they're not focused on adding features, these frameworks are generally faster. That being said, there are some negative aspects as well. Engineers will probably end up writing more code overall as the app grows. There are more things to configure, set up, and possibly break. And finally, adding that simple feature might be a lot more work than it had you selected a more uh, robust framework. The other type of framework is usually called opinionated or sometimes batteries included. These are things like Sales.js, Rails, or CakePHP. They allow developers to build uh, feature robust apps with unit tests and boilerplates abstracted away. They allow you to get things that just work because they follow conventional best practices such as file names or method names. Since these frameworks are feature rich, they usually come with support for automagical API and DB code to create read, update, and destroy data, or CRUD. There are some cons though. Since there are a lot of features, you may have to wait for long installs for all the dependencies of the application. You sometimes have to uh, have slower performance because there's a lot more things to disable or turn off to speed up the server. And in a few instances, even for myself, it's sometimes hard to customize, so you end up wasting tons of time just trying to add a simple feature that, go out, that goes outside the opinion of the framework. Whether one chooses a lightweight or an opinionated framework, the expected features are usually about the same. 
We want it to be fast. We want it to be extensible. We expect intuitive routing and parameter extraction. We expect form data handling and JSON friendliness. We expect static file support and correct support for HTTP and possibly WebSockets. We expect access logging. And we expect some sort of database connectivity that's also injection safe. Of course, opinionated frameworks often add extra icing on the cake. They might have a view layer that returns HTML. They probably have model view controller. They probably have some way to make CRUD very quickly with APIs and databases. They might have GraphQL built in. They might have database ORMs to help you map out your data. They might have streamlined authentication checks with authentication servers or JSON web tokens. They also might have authorization checks to prevent unallowed access to resources. They might support asset uh, and organize your static assets like CSS, JavaScript, and HTML. And finally, they might have all the other kitchen sink features like email, database migrations, and what have you. So is Rust web yet? Many people say yes, but I think there is a lack of opinionated frameworks. The reason an opinionated framework hasn't been seen quite yet is because it's hard to build one. It takes a large team to build one. I don't think there's anything out there on Rust to replace Rails, CakePHP, Django, or Sales, but one can definitely say that lightweight frameworks have reached a great level of maturity in Rust. In the next half of my presentation, we're going to build out our thoughts on full stack web development and uh, build a greenfield Rust application using a lightweight framework in Rust. Rust and full stack. Our Rust application will be a bare bones used car website, which will list the latest used cars and their prices, and also allow users to search for specific cars within the database. Our goal is to build a Rust web server that connects to MySQL, caches in Redis, leverages Melee Search, and uses React in the front end with TypeScript and Rust WebAssembly binaries. We'll also get some help along the way with Webpack, Docker, and Kubernetes. Our front end web application contains a handful of files organized in a typical React convention. It has Rust via WebAssembly and uses WASMpack to help build out some type safe number crunching. To save time, I've also used Bootstrap for the UI component library to give an extra visual flair. Our backend application only contains five feet files. The main file is the entry point and we'll set up the web server. And inside of the car module folder, we'll look at some easy ways to set up a CRUD with MySQL, cache with Redis, and search with Melee Search. First, we'll explore the web server. With Rust, the options for backend servers are thankfully widely available. Actix jumps out as a top candidate as they provide a powerful lightning fast framework for building web applications with Rust. As a matter of fact, it recently ranked second overall in a Tech Empower Run benchmark, losing only to Drogon, a C++ based web framework. Considering that Actix is first and foremost focused on safety over benchmarks, placing second is fine with me. Our Rust web server will use Actix as, as the core, which is a lightweight or, mi lightweight or micro framework. Actix makes it super simple to start writing web servers. Here I am able to specify the path and the permitted method as git slash using that macro at the top of the file. This limits unsupported requests to the server's index wrap. In our reference app, we can quickly set up an HTTP server and configure common pieces of our full stack application in one place. Here I create the server. Next, I can assign data resources to the app's data extractors with MySQL and Redis databases. After that, I can drop in my create, read, update, destroy methods from other abstracted modules and pass them into a configure method to connect them to our web server. We'll take a look at this module in a little bit. Finally, we can serve static assets. Which, one sh which I've done last to ensure minimal collision to the other server routes above. This will grab our front-end application, including our WebAssembly files. Let's take a look at the model layer of this application. 
For the database layer, I've opted to use SQL X as it is a pure REST-based SQL crate that features great async support and compile time checked queries. The compile time query checker is extremely powerful and lightweight, allowing for type checked SQL strings while you are editing code. But what does that even look like? Here I purposely break my code a little bit to show off the powerful feature in the SQL X macro. First I change the car struct price property to assigned 32-bit number, which results in a compiler error for a type mismatch against the database. Price should be unsigned. Next, I remove the selection of year from my query, which then creates another compiler error when I try to use the uh, query result later on. I think this feature alone is phenomenal, but the crate is also 100% safe code and works with PostgreSQL, MySQL, SQLite, and MSSQL. Our schema for the database stores each of the desired attributes of a used car, such as price, year, make, model, mileage, color, and the state within the US the car is currently located in. Next, we create a struct in our Rust model that mimics the, the database columns exactly. Our data itself comes from a Kaggle dataset that has over 2,500 cars listed with various attributes, which were imported into our MySQL database. <clears throat> The implementation for this example allows users to read from the database, whether it be to find all cars or to find any cars by an ID. I opted not to opt, uh, implement the other types of CRUD features. As part of our contract with Actix, we also need to implement a responder trait for the car struct. The main purpose of this is to define the expected response of this particular struct, which in our case is just JSON. Using SQL X and Actix, we have fairly easy wired up a backend server that can retrieve content from the database and send it over HTTP in a JSON format. Here is our front end pulling data via JSON fetch from the web REST server. It's a little slow as it's retrieving 2,500 rows of data each time a user clicks that button on the front end. Let's take a look at the web server routes and see if we can improve some things by caching MySQL in a response for a short period of time to reduce the server load. So let's look at the routes layer. Within our cars module, inside the routes file, we have a couple of functions that pair with our model functions. For instance, this is the function that is called when our API requests the slash cars route, and it returns back a list of cars as JSON, utilizing our model function you see there, car find all. Each time the user clicks that card load button on the front end, it retrieves the fresh data from the database. Chances are, the database hasn't changed that much frequently, so we can add a thin layer of cache to improve performance right here at the route level, a common practice. Going back to our earlier slide, we want to first check the cache, and if it exists, return it. Otherwise, grab the data from the database, cache it, and return the response. A similar flow can be handled on the outside of the server using something like Varnish, which is another technology. But I find that application level caching rules give the application developer themselves more control and less mystery about what the DevOps team is doing with the cache. Here we've now updated the function to handle the cache just as described. I've collapsed the code a little bit to show the high level flow. First, we check the Redis cache using the git command with Redis. Then we convert our Redis result into an option, where it's either some data with cars in it that we can immediately respond with JSON, or none, meaning that there was either an error or no data in Redis. If we match with the none, we can just pull the data from the MySQL database using our model function, car find all. And then we also want to uh, wrap up and save that fresh database data into Redis with a set and expiration command. This data will expire in 300 sec seconds, or about 5 minutes. And then we need to remember to send the DB data through the response as JSON at the end of this second half. Here we can see the response improvements by just adding a simple object cache layer using an in-memory store like Redis. 
The first request on a cold cache results in a response time of 180 milliseconds. The subsequent requests all benefit from Redis, Redis's memory and save more than half the time. This allows us to scale our services across more users and also shave down time and cost. Let's now look through the search engine. Adding a search engine gives an extra boost to web applications usability as it allows the user to find exactly what they are looking for. Within the Rust ecosystem, I have found great success and joy with Melee Search, a Rust-based search engine that has many similar features to Elasticsearch, but comes with some smooth setup out of the box. Why Melee Search? Well, like I said, it works out of the box with any con configuration. It's very fast. It uses a conventional setup to avoid the schema headaches of typical search engines. It's Docker friendly. They even have first party Docker images. It's typo tolerant. And it has great first party clients for Rust, JS, and many other popular languages. <clears throat> to show off how easy it is, here is the search engine indexing script. For anyone that has ever mucked around with Elasticsearch, you can see how elegant this is. First, we create an index in the Melee search engine. Then we retrieve data from the MySQL database. Next, we map the database into a vector of car structs. This code is the same as the one within the car model, by the way, but I just copy pasted it here for clarity. Finally, we send that data off to Melee search to start indexing and it's usually available within seconds of the, on the publicly searchable interface. This function is called as part of the Rust web server startup sequence as an example, but you would probably want to offload this into some sort of Kubernetes cron job. Here is a demo of the search feature on the front end. I put it in a modal just to make it easier, but you can see that searching through it is near instantaneous and provides back more of the filtered cars that you want to look at. On the front end, we have a fairly typical React application that handles basic user interface and form handling. Of interest is a utility function that allows us to send over 2,500 rows of card data into a Rust function to allow it to run type safe computations on it. In the Rust file, we have our same struct here, which I lazily copied over, but I could have also imported. Here's the output struct that the front-end TypeScript is also expecting. In our Rust function, we operate a type-safe computation that sums up and averages price, year, and mileage for all cars and then returns them back to the front-end as a car stats object. Here it is in action. Once the user loads the list of cars, a new button appears that says Compute Averages with WASM. This button will take the current list of 2,500 cars and send it over to our Rust function. Once, once the Rust function computes the average, it'll return it back to the JavaScript code, which allows React to render the results. The final step in our epic full stack launch party is to deploy our app somewhere. That somewhere is going to be Kubernetes. We want our app to, to be deployed securely, efficiently, and easily. Here's what our full stack app build will look like after it is containerized and running in a Kubernetes cluster. We can use any cloud provider that is Kubernetes friendly and deploys a single, deploy a single Kubernetes cluster, which will hold our REST web server that connects to MySQL, caches data in Redis, leverages Melee Search, and hosts its own React TypeScript WebAssembly uh, front end application. Normally, you might consider using the cloud provider's offerings for things like a database as it affords you replication and automated backups for a small extra price. But in this example, we are keeping everything close by. We already know about the internal systems a little bit that are represented with pods in this Kubernetes cluster. Let's look at some of the outside stuff I've added. A load balancer here helps us distribute our traffic across multiple zones and servers to allow evenly managed resources and scale up and scale down events to also help our app grow and shrink with traffic. Ingress helps Kubernetes route external requests to their desired Kubernetes service and turn to serve traffic to the correct pod. Ingress can also handle a few other things like TLS certificate management and path routing 
serve different apps on different paths. We configure a modest cluster, and then we set up our Kubernetes config. First, we create persistent volume claims, one for MySQL and one for MailySearch. A persistent volume claim is important for data as it means that a container, if a container or pod dies or restarts, our data associated with it doesn't go down. For MySQL, this means all the actual raw file system data and the index data. For Melee Search, this also means the generated index data. As noted before, the MySQL within a Kubernetes cluster is bare bones. If we want to ensure automated backups and replication that's cost effective and safe, I'd opt to use the cloud provider. Now we create a deployment for our Kubernetes cluster, which just provides a declarative way to update our pods and describe a state. And the deployment controller will handle the setup and teardown as well as auto scaling. In our system here, you can see four containers, the, the, the four that we've talked about, our full stack app, search, Redis, and MySQL. If we dive into the container spec for the primary Rust web application server we've created, you'll see a number of things I've configured. The Docker image to use. Here it is being stored privately within GCP's container registry, but they can come from anywhere. The container service port. The desired resource al allocation for my application. And a readiness probe that will attempt to communicate with the server on the desired port and the path to determine if an app is ready to start, or if it's failed. If we briefly glance at the search and Redis container specs, we can also see similar concepts. For both, we specify the image name and optionally a version. And Kubernetes will look for these Docker images on Docker Hub for us automatically. Another thing to point out here is that we choose to mount the persistent volume that contains the search engine index data for Melee Search. <clears throat> In the service config, we select the full stack Docker container, target it by port 2020, and then expose it under a Kubernetes service with a more standard port of 80. We also do the same with a search engine, allowing Melee Search to handle traffic directly. We can configure the ingress to decorate a load balancer with a TLS certificate to ensure all traffic is sent over HTTPS. This is done with the help of a thing called a cluster issuer, which allows a system like Cert Manager to automate TLS renewal with another system called Let's Encrypt. And last but not least, let's look at some auto magical Kubernetes fun. Here we are able to send search traffic to the relevant pod that handles Melee Search and send the rest of the data to the uh, web server. The key here is the path property, which designates the rules to track the correct traffic to the correct server. This allows us to send search traffic to the right pod. Our Rust app is now deployed with TLS on a Kubernetes cluster and it's ready for traffic. You can see the live app at fullstack.cameramanaving.com, which also includes a link to the GitHub repo. That's it. I hope you enjoyed the journey. I know it was probably a little tricky here at the end as there are a lot of things to look through and I appreciate your patience. I also hope you enjoyed the first half of my talk, which talked about full stack web development. See you guys later. All right, everyone, I hope you enjoyed that. We are now ready to go live with Cameron to answer some of the great questions you all have been asking in the Q&A. Thank you for that. So let's bring Cameron live. Hi there, Cameron. Hi, how's it going, guys? Yeah, welcome. First of all, thanks so much for being here with Rust Lab, even though it's virtual this time around. We're really happy to have you here. Um, Thank you. Of course. Yeah, do you have anything to say about your participation? in Rust Lab before we go on to the Q&A? Oh, 
just for everybody involved, it's been very uh, wonderful to be part of this convention. And I think it's been very helpful, uh, especially since I'm remote in another country. And the communication has been great. So thank you, everyone involved. Fantastic. Awesome. All right. Well, we'll go ahead and proceed with the questions now. We've got a lot in chat. Uh, first one, I think I'm going to try again. Dolgo Foley Roman. He asks a great question. He says, I understand why you use Actix, but have you tried to use Rocket from the master branch? Uh, yeah, so I did look at Rocket as well. Uh, and basically, I like, I like it a lot. It's a great framework. But it, uh, the reason I chose Actix in this time is because of the other library, SQL X, which has a tighter integration with Actix currently. Uh, I know that the Rocket team is adding some more features to help SQL X work better, but currently uh, Rocket is more designed to work with Diesel, which is also another good uh, ORM for REST. Awesome. And um, I saw you type in the Q&A. Nobody else could see it, so I'll put it in the chat here that you also said that Rocket supports SQL X in some degree, and yes. you linked the, the GitHub. So I put that there. Um, all right, let's go to the next question here, also by Roman. He says, um, isn't also a full stack a problem that developers um, not so experienced in the field um, so that they can be seen as senior as full stack, but in uh, just back or front, they are like middle engineers? Yeah, so uh, I think what what you're asking uh, is basically a full stack engineer is sometimes more uh, general, has more general knowledge, but not specific depth knowledge. And I, I do see that. Uh, there are some people, though, that are have the institutional knowledge where they've worked at a company for so long that they either, they either know all of the, the business secrets or they just look, they've worked on all the code bases. So they kind of have senior experience within that company. Uh, likewise, though, I have worked with senior front end or senior back end engineers that don't have as many skills as maybe a typical full stack developer is. I can't really explain why, but that just happens. Uh, but to, and with a middle engineer, they do kind of have more general knowledge, but I consider myself a full stack engineer and I've worked alongside seniors of back end and front end. And sometimes I, I wouldn't say I beat them, but I, I say, hey, well, why don't we try this? And they're like, I don't know what that is. And I'll say, well, let's look it up together. So I think it just depends on overall experience in terms of years at that point. Sure, sure, that makes sense. Thank you for that. All right, we have another question here by Paul. Uh, Paul says, could you explain a bit more how you connected the Rust Wasm code with React? He says he's new to Wasm. Oh, sure. So I in the repo, I use a plugin called uh, Webpack Wasm plugin, I believe. And it's also used in a system called Wasmpack, which is a very popular way to connect uh, front-end JavaScript code with any kind of WebAssembly, but uh, typically with Rust. And uh, basically, when you create uh, some files in Rust, you put it through some kind of process, which creates a WebAssembly file, a .wasm. And then uh, within your JavaScript code, you're, you're going to use a framework like Rollup or Webpack or some other uh, bundler. And that takes care of this process that imports it. And the import is the ES6 style, where you use the import syntax. And it's able to pull in the file and load it in the browser. And then the browser is able to kind of, uh, I guess, uh, uh, compile it in just in time while you're running it. Uh, so it becomes like a external dependency, but it loads it just like a JavaScript file would be loaded, where it's kind of just another file that's loaded into the browser. And then it uh, exposes whatever functions you create inside your Rust application that are public uh, to some degree. So there's some controls over that. but Whatever you name in Rust as a function becomes available in the browser as just a, a function that's loaded within that module. OK, thank you. And um, Paul asks also if you could send the repo link. I don't know if you oh, have sure. that to, to maybe send in chat to everyone. Yeah, uh, I'll send over a couple links. Let's see. So I put in, should I put in Q and A or room chat? I'll put in room chat. Yeah. Yeah, room chat's perfect, so everyone can see it. So Thanks. here's the live running demo. It's running. That's running on Kubernetes, and then here's the repo itself, which has all the code, including the Kubernetes files and all that. Um, yeah, I can also send over the docs for React and Wasm. Fantastic. We appreciate all the resources. Yeah. Wonderful. 
Uh, I do have to note that in my present, the video presentation, I had a bug in my Kubernetes YAML, which I fixed in the repo in case anybody noticed it with re regards to the ingress. But if inside the repo, I fix the ingress so that it properly routes to the search engine. Awesome. Yeah, that's something that's something fun. You can always, uh, you know, between the point of your video and the live, definitely things can happen. So yeah, that's yeah. fine. <laughs> All right, we have another question from Roman. He says, uh, two to three years ago, work on uh, Rust full stack was more violent, uh, was more like frameworks like you and so on. And uh, from your point of view, what happened now that all of this work uh, struggle? I'm <laughs> sorry, I don't understand the last part, but hopefully you do. Uh, so I guess if I were to think about it, maybe it's more, you're saying it was more difficult two or three years ago, perhaps. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I do think you has been one of the main drivers in the REST community. It's, it's grown dramatically. Um, I've tried to make my own front end framework in Rust, and it's very hard. I built a macro that creates, I haven't published it because it's buggy, but it's very hard to make good macros that take HTML code, uh, like with a kind of like a React style or a view style, and create a compiler ready uh, runtime that runs either JavaScript or Rust in a browser. So I think U is one of the best frameworks out there currently, and I would give it a thumbs up. Uh, if you're looking to do like a full package of full stack development in Rust. Um, whoops, oh, I'll look at that question next. But yeah, uh, I think, like I said before in my talk, I, I think there's a lack of opinionated frameworks. I think U is probably the closest, but I, I don't see anything that's really like Ruby on Rails or Django or Cake PHP or SalesJS where you can just kind of flip a switch and have your database, your Redis, your login, your authentication just all turn on with like just install in a code base, right? So it's still a while to go. I would say it's probably going to be another couple of years before we see that, perhaps. Mm, OK. Uh, all right, we've got a couple more questions coming in. Great. So the next one comes from Yusina Austral, uh, who says, hi, awesome talk. If you are using an application cache, it's not better to reply with, oh, isn't it better to reply with 304 not modified instead of sending the whole list of cars again to the client? Yes, it is. So the, you can leverage the browser cache to help uh, prevent uh, basically the same data being sent over. Uh, but the if you're talking about from the server side, it still has to make the request to do the database to check that it's not been modified. So I do like to have a, a Redis application cache layer to prevent just the call of the database in the first place. Uh, but in that case, yes, you'd want to send over a 304 not modified for that request as well from the Redis cache. OK, thank you. Uh, let's see, we've got another question here, which is a great one by Anil Chatti, who says, uh, can you please share your journey into Rust? Sure. So uh, I'm a, currently a CTO, and we use a lot of Node.js and Docker, Kubernetes, and React. And we were looking for some more performant uh, memory saved stuff for some, certain parts of our application. So we started with uh, a Rust indexer, which basically we use it as a way to create backups of all of our databases. So we wrote a bunch of uh, libraries that are, we can't share, unfortunately, that let us back up MySQL, Mongo, Redis, um, and also GitHub repos. And it stores them into uh, tarball files and sends them over to Amazon S3. But we wrote that originally in command line with bash. It was pretty fast, but it wasn't memory safe. And it had a lot of crashes that were hard to uh, configure. So then we kind of ported it to Node.js, because that was our language that we're using currently. And it was faster, but it still wasn't as memory safe as we'd like it because it would create weird bugs when you'd have you know 10 gigabytes of MySQL data trying to stream from a server into a file into a tarball. So then we rewrote it again into Rust, which was, as everybody would say, there's a huge learning curve. But since we already had all the logic figured out in both Bash and Node.js, really just had to port it and not have to rewrite it. Just kind of, here's what we did in Node. Let's do this same process in Rust. So that was our original journey. And then later on, we needed to have a search engine on our system. So we looked at, of course, Elasticsearch and Algolia Search. And both of them are great products, but we wanted something that was easier to set up on a local dev server, also cheaper than Algolia because you had to pay for it. And uh, we found Melee Search. And that was uh, 
a great option for us because it runs really easily. You just uh, turn on the Docker image. It's already configured to run with normal setup. Oh, here goes a cat. I have, I have cats. <laughs> I get lots of cats around. today. Fantastic. <laughs> yeah. Um, so with that, uh, yeah, we, Rust was uh, kind of a big selling point for my team. And then personally, I just was looking for something to replace my uh, usage of C Sharp, which was kind of my main strict language. Since I write a lot of code in Node.js, I try to use TypeScript. Um, I formerly used a lot of ActionScript, but as we all know, Flash is no longer really around. So I kind of wanted to replace my strict language with something. So I looked at Rust and Go, and I chose Rust over Go. And that's how I started my journey, I guess. Awesome. Great. Well, thank you so much for that. Uh, do we have, yes, we have another question here from <laughs> Roman. Great. Um, he says, as full stack, what do you want most of all in Rust in the near future in terms of tools or language features? Uh, so I think the, well, the work with futures in general has been very exciting. I, uh, in async await, I've been, I've, I've writ rewritten my code bases a couple of times with all the changes in futures and async await. So I've been kind of watching those with a, a, a strong will to wait for, for it to become more normal. Uh, there are some things though that I like about macros that, oh, there's another cat in the background there. That's Frankie, <laughs> that's a girl. Uh, so yeah, there's a there's some a couple of features in macros, like a uh, procedural macros that have to be ported into that other library, uh, proc macros too, I always forget the name, but it's kind of annoying because you have these two different uh, macro libraries and they don't interrupt really well sometimes. So I, there are some features that I'd like to be ported over into the main uh, Rust macro that would be helpful to help kind of write uh, stronger macros natively, I guess you'd say in Rust instead of having to use the library. Um, and like I said before, I think the, the lack of opinionated frameworks is kind of making a hold off for some of these big teams that want to move their applications over without having to rewrite all their code. Sounds good, all right. I think that's, uh, that's the last of our questions. Wow, lots of good ones today. So thank you all for those great questions. Um, was there anything else you wanted to add to any of that? Um, if uh, anybody ever has questions, feel free to message me on how you find me uh, or ask questions on the repo that I've slacked out. Um, I'm open for tech support, basically. I'm also on the Rust Slack instance. If, you've, if you're on there, you can at me and say hello. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. And uh, thanks to all of you coming. And thank you so much for, for, your, for your time. I know it's, uh, it's almost 6 a.m. there. So uh, you'll probably have breakfast after this. Um, thanks yes. for coming for the time zone difference thing. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Awesome. Well, hopefully we'll see you again next year for Rust Lab, whether it be face-to-face well, yeah, -face to. or in virtually like this. Yeah. All right. Thank well, um, have a good breakfast, a good rest of your day, and we'll see you around. Thank you. You too. Thank you. Bye. All right, everyone. So um, that was the last question of the day. I just want to remind you all that if you liked this talk by Cameron, you can go on to the Rust Lab agenda page and uh, rate it on the site. And uh, next up in about 12 minutes or so, we have the last Rust Lab talk uh, from Nicola Martino using Rust from JavaScript, a real life case. So uh, see you in about 12 minutes. Yeah, talk to you soon. Bye-bye.